OK, everyone, I think we're going to try to get started. Be fairly strict, the 10.35, and get us out in time for lunch. So thank you all for coming today. And uh, thanks to the organizers for setting this up. It's been a lot of fun the last day and a half. I'm looking forward to the rest of it. I'm going to give a, a brief introduction. And uh, Nina, my colleague and co-moderator, will, will describe the session a little bit more. And then we'll get into the, get into the substance of it. Uh, but my name is Julian Jameson. I'm a senior behavioral economist at the World Bank in the Global Insights Initiative. Hopefully, you were all at Varun's talk uh, recently. You heard a little bit more about that. Uh, and, and I had previously been in academia, and then maybe more relevant for today's session, I spent several years at the Federal Reserve Bank in Boston, nearby here, near South Station for the locals, and then moved down to Washington, DC, and spent three years with the US government at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So the financial regulatory agency, the new agency created uh, by Elizabeth Warren, uh, is, is how most people know it, uh, although Richard Cordray is the director now. And I was in charge of a small group applying behavioral insights and experimental economics to, to consumer finance and, and to the regulatory policy there. So coming from, from the government side uh, and, and the academic and research side, that was in the Office of Research, and now in the research group of the World Bank applying this to, to development policy, which has been exciting. So let me introduce the other the other folks in our session, so my, my colleague and co-moderator, uh, Nina Mazar, is a senior behavioral scientist at the Global Insights Initiative. So with, with Varun, we are the Global Insights Initiative, basically, <laughs> <laughs> so you've got all of us in the room here. Don't be careful. Yeah, I know, there's a, there are some limitations. Don't tell our boss they're all in the same place at the same time. Um, and uh, Nina is also an associate professor of marketing at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. She's been, uh, we're fortunate enough to have her for a couple of years from there. Uh, and and uh, she's a marketing professor and background in, in marketing there, but has also worked with uh, Canadian government and local governments and other governments as well as, as, well as companies on, on a range of topics. And the three members of our panel, um, I'll start with uh, Carla Gonzalez here, uh, who I was talking to learn has, has an MBA and a law degree, uh, is trained as a mediator and negotiator. Um, previously worked in government in Costa Rica, including as Secretary of the Public Works and Transportation Ministry, and is now with us at the World Bank uh, as, as Practice Manager for the Transport and, and ICT Group in South Asia, the World Bank Group, and she's held other positions there as well. So again, background in government as well as in, in operations at the World Bank, which is going to be, I think, great, great for this session. Sanjay Micha, behind her. Uh, I, was, I was chatting with him at lunch yesterday. He was studying at the Kennedy School 20 years ago here, which I realized afterwards I was actually in, in graduate school at the same time at the, the school down Mass Ave, the other school on Mass Ave, which, which I probably can't name here at Harvard, but the, the, the other one nearby, Max Bazemann, would be upset. So, so it's great, it's, it's, and it's great to have him back. He's a career civil servant uh, in India, has worked at the local, provincial, and federal level including as a senior staffer in the Prime Minister's office, as Chief Secretary, which is the head of the civil service in West Bengal, and is currently Secretary of the Federal Ministry of Road Transport and Highways, dealing with regulation and infrastructure. So we're very fortunate to have him here. And last but not least, Rafe Mazur is a financial sector specialist at the Consultative Group to Assist the Poor, which is an organization he can maybe tell you a little bit more about, uh, focused on financial access and financial inclusion, housed within the World Bank, but really fairly autonomous agency and partnership groups. So it, um, it, it's interesting, and they have a, a, a lot of power and a lot of interesting things they're doing there. So his research focuses on especially behavioral approaches to consumer financial protection and also partnering with governments and financial service providers around the world. So we're looking forward to the panel, looking forward to your questions. I'll turn it over to Nina for now. I don't need it. Yeah, I don't need it since I have this one. So just very briefly what the structure of this panel is going to be. So the plan is that we will have about 15 to 20 minutes of presentation by Rafe first and then by Carla. And then we will invite all three panelists to the front. And we have pre prepared a few questions to get an idea of how do you even go about using behavioral insights for development projects. How does it start? What are the obstacles, for example, on the World Bank side? What do we have to think about? But also on the government side, like what are the issues that, that uh, all kinds of agencies and governments are thinking about that excite them maybe about behavioral insights or that maybe make them also a bit afraid of 
using the behavioral insights. That's basically the idea of this uh, panel. And um, obviously, we will also have plenty of time for your questions. And that is basically what, what the structure is supposed to be. And um, I'm assuming that there are no questions about the structure of the panel. <laughs> so given that, we can start with you, Raif. Great, thank you. And yeah, so you're supposed to use this for the recording and just okay. hold it very close. Good morning, everyone. Um, oh, here's my pointer. And Karabuni, as we would say in Kenya. Um, I'm Rafe Mazur, and as Julian mentioned, I work with CGAP. Uh, we're focused on financial access. So expanding innovative solutions to allow more people to have access to the formal financial services that they need for their daily lives. and. Um, we also run a very nice photo contest every year, which gives us lots of great uh, filler slides. And uh, <laughs> it's actually the thing that gets us the most press, uh, more than our technical work. Uh, so I'm based in Nairobi um, in our you know, two-person office there. And I focus on working with con financial consumer protection regulators. Um, a lot of times, this is units within central banks to use behavioral insights to try and improve consumer protection policy. And I'm going to share today a bit of that, that work and sort of why we've invested pretty heavily in this. Um, so I think I don't have to convince people here that behavioral research matters. Um, but from our lens, we think it's particularly important for financial services in emerging markets um, because of issues like complexity or information asymmetry um, between recently banked lower income consumers um, and professional financial staff who do not always have aligned incentives. Um, and also, I think the personally why I care about this is a lot of the population in the markets we're working in are in the informal sector. And so that means low and variable incomes. And the consequences of misaligned financial products or services or negative financial outcomes are even more significant for them, um, just as the benefits of things like access to just in crime credit are even more significant because they don't always have the sort of reserve liquidity that I may have as a, as a you know, well-off salaried uh, person. So what I want to share is how we, over the past um, several years, have gotten started trying to turn these consumer protection teams into behavioralists. And I'll try and get through quickly uh, cases from Mexico, from Ghana, and from East Africa, um, sharing different consumer protection topics and different tools we use. I think you'll notice in these approaches, a lot of times, I think you compare to what we saw this morning, where there's really impressive, um, you know, large RCT um, interventions, we have to start smaller because a lot of, in the case of Ghana, for example, it's a consumer protection team um, in a market of 24 million um, with more than 500 licensed microfinance providers alone. Um, and there's six people. So, and we've, we don't even have any consumer protection regulations on the book yet. So we have to start smaller. The challenge is what can we do at $50,000 or less. That is behavioral, that will improve policy. And so just to dive in, I'll start with Mexico, which actually is a very high capacity partner. So we partnered with Condusef, which is the financial consumer protection agency in Mexico. Um, it's a dedicated one outside of the financial sector regulators. And what I'm showing you now, it looks like just a basic advertisement for consumer credit. Um, and if you could see the numbers, you probably would be in shock because it is really expensive to borrow in Mexico. That is the APR equivalent in Mexico, the, the costo annual total. And so Conducef approached us with this issue of we have, we have this rule that we instituted around pricing information and calculation of sort of standard cost of credit and standard return on savings products, but we're seeing it's not really impacting consumers. And so they said, what can we do about this? So uh, we did a, a kind of two-stage project with them. The first was a basic lab testing where we looked at the market information. We did qualitative interviews with consumers and got to see them skip right past the 620% APR 
to the weekly payment because they think in cash flow. They think, you know, can I make this work? If I had an emergency, if my child was sick, could I make this three months, you know, incredibly expensive uh, credit work? They don't think about 620% is, you know, exorbitant and predatory. So we have to turn it into terms that work for them. So we did a range of tests, and I'll just give a quick example. So what we would do is, you know, standard lab testing. We recruited um, lower, lower income consumers in the Mexico City area, and we would run through a series of shopping exercises where they were looking at between five and 10 competing products using different disclosure formats in each round and different products with different price points so we could control for you know, price sensitivity. And we tested um, various different formats that the government ourselves had, had developed to measure which ones do cons help consumers make the best choices. And a quick example in credit, one of the things that we wanted to do, they were interested in comparative information. And so we tested a few different ver versions of a comparative table this one is five lenders, and this, it's only four key information points. And we had a longer uh, list of about 12 information points in credit. So we tested um, just the, the most basic information and kind of everything you would want to know to see which is more useful. Um, also, one of the things we did, and you see on the next slide, is this one. It's the total amount you pay in a monetary unit. Because as I mentioned, we see that these consumers think in cash flow. Whereas in this version, we were testing percentage-based. You can see this version has 10 options. So we did this in a few other formats with uh, credit and savings products. And your behavioralist, you're not going to be surprised to see that the simple and shorter one dominates in terms of consumers choosing the best product, in particular in savings. And one of the things we found in savings that was hard for consumers to understand is the interaction of interest and maintenance and hidden fees, because there are a lot of hidden fees on current accounts in Mexico. Um, so we also wanted to see what is the experience with um, when you go in to receive a product. How, what's the role of sales staff? So we developed a mystery shopping uh, tool. And this working paper was published um, with Javier Gine. He's an economist at the World Bank um, who was the lead economist on this. I'm not an economist. I'm a bureaucrat. But uh, so, so be, be nice to me. Um, and, um, one of the things we did, you know, typical mystery shopping, going in looking for certain products, but we also varied some of the signaling um, based on work that Santosh Anagal did in India on whole life insurance around relative experience level. So referencing that you were a first time consumer looking for a loan or that you had been going around to other institutions to see some signaling effects. Um, we also had referencing, you know, competing rates at other firms to see if that had any impact. And we even had the shoppers from one day to the next dress differently. So one day, dress like you're hanging out in the house on a Saturday. The next day, dress like you're going to church on a Sunday. And we wanted to see what was the, the effect of these things. Um, so what's interesting is across the board, so red is experience, orange is experience. And these are some of the, the highlights that we see um, there was a higher points of information in savings and credit. But also when we looked at, we, and then we also had people request different amounts of, uh, of credit relative to their actual income. So this is where using actual consumers is helpful. And we saw they did a pretty good job saying, OK, higher debt relative to income, you had a higher probability to be rejected. But then we also see that when we look at the mean change in the loan offering, so they reduced the high debt people by this. But just the fact from one day to the next that a shopper changed their dress to nice clothes, they were given on average 849 Mexican pesos more of, of loan, loan value. So you see they do a good job on certain things, but then we're all sort of biased from certain signaling effects, such as experience or the way you dress. And this is important, particularly when we're looking at lower income consumer segments um, in kind of stratified societies. Um, so just moving along, uh, another example Another common consumer protection issue we face is complaints handling. So worked in a lot of markets, and one of the challenges is lower income consumers a lot of times do not make formal complaints, even when really significant negative financial outcomes occur. And there's some issues of agency that we think are at play with that. We also think there's some design barriers. Um, for example, in Ghana, the Bank of Ghana approached us with this project, and at that point, the only way in which they received complaints was through a written letter 
to the headquarters. So you can imagine you're kind of, you're kind of ruling out a lot of Ghanaian consumers to ever go to the government for help and financial services. But to their credit, they wanted to do a behavioral mapping. So we did behavioral mapping where we interviewed consumers about their complaints experiences. We segmented consumers who had had a problem with financial service and had tried to resolve it formally and who had not bothered because we thought there was something going on with lower income segments around there. And so we found there was issues of saliency. People don't even think of that they could submit a formal complaint. Um, and then there's deterrence. We saw at the branch level in particular, not having dedicated staff at branch levels or being aware that Bank of Ghana can be a uh, sort of neutral third party uh, mediator on these complaints. Um, then we thought there were also issues of follow up. So a lot of burden was being put on consumers to be responsible to check in with that reticent branch manager who received your complaint, put it to the side, hasn't done anything in a week. And a lot of times if you're rural, you have travel costs and time costs to go to the branches. Um, and we also found really low awareness. People knew Bank of Ghana, but they had no idea it was a resource for consumer protection because it's a relatively new unit. Um, so we did a series of activities. And I think one of the things that's more, most important in this case is not just the insights, but getting a policymaker down to the consumer level. So these are examples of, we use icon mapping to have consumers design the actual experience with a complaint and then an idealized version. And then we challenge the Bank of Ghana team um, to take those and to develop standard processes for the regulation and consumer facing information. And so we've now, the regulations are coming out soon. And basically we use this information to develop clear and articulated procedures for escalation to put more of the burden on follow-up and notification on the providers, uh, not the consumers. And we also develop some consumer-facing materials. And just this is the final layout for what will be a poster to be required in all branches of financial service providers in Ghana. And what I want to emphasize is that you can see 20 and 20. That comes up over and over again, because that's the maximum amount of time a financial institution is permitted to resolve a complaint, because we found there was a problem with consumers where there's no guarantee of turnaround time. And so they would wait and wait and wait and not know what is the day when I can go back to institutions and say, hey, I haven't heard from you. You are obligated by law. And we're thinking about integrating things like SMS reminders in this as well. So the consumer could be pinged, hey, did you hear back on your case? If not, it's been 20 days. Please contact Bank of Ghana or the financial service provider. All right, so the last case. This is a case where I think, I, I work in East Africa where we've had a lot of innovation in financial services in the past few years. We've had, in particular, driven by mobile money. Um, so how many people here have heard of something called M-Pesa? Great. So M-Pesa and similar products are basically electronic currency that is delivered through a phone. So I have on, on this phone right now probably about $300 in my M-Pesa account, and I use it to pay taxis, I use it to pay for gas, I use it to send money, I can even use it to get loans now. So that's a good opportunity because access to liquidity is hard and doing it remote and in a sort of in a low cost way, we can reach more consumers. You can get a loan for as small as $2 um, now in Kenya. But there's also some behavioral issues we have with digital credit. We think that there might be some, some things that will be different on the consumer side that could lead to sort of oversaturation or, or you know, kind of credit bubbles in the market. So we're wondering, in particular with push SMSs, how is that going to affect temptation? Um, how does the fact that these are very expensive but small short-term loans, what's the role of hyperbolic discounting here, where people will not really be internalizing the end costs of something that is relatively small monetarily but especially when it's immediate and it's, it's digital. Um, we're also, we've seen some clever framing of the push marketing around, you know, act now, don't miss out, those kind of things that create sort of loss aversion. Um, we've seen some issues around the framing. So check your loan limit, check how much you would qualify for, and that frames the consumer to then ask for that amount, even if they didn't need that much liquidity right now. So it sort of, it, it 
it anchors them to the highest amount they could qualify for. And then also there's been some interesting work in the US that were, has influenced us around people spending more when they spend with only a credit card for a week versus spending in cash. And now that we've digitized the money, you don't feel the pain of paying as much. I know I certainly don't. Um, so what we, we also have some core consumer protection issues in this space. So this is a loan acceptance screen in Kenya on a, on a phone. It's run on a basic USSD platform. Um, and this says, you wish to request this easy loan of 1,000 shillings. I've read and accepted the terms and conditions on this link. What about if I'm like the majority of Kenyans who don't have a smartphone, doesn't have internet in the house? I'm never going to be able to even read the terms and conditions, but I click OK because I need the loan. Um, where is the cost? It's a thousand shillings. It's not advertised anywhere. And in fact, this provider, they, oops, sorry, they, they market 2% loan. But the truth is, this loan is 2% to 8% variable. They never disclose the cost prior to purchase. And in this case, this consumer was paying 6%. And we said, how much is the loan? I said, 2%. And then we looked, and he was paying 1,060. So there's no upfront savings. So what we're doing is we're working with some providers who want to improve this. And this is a case, a lab experiment that we did with Juno, a digital lender in Kenya. We did several rounds of treatments to try and increase upfront saliency from consumers. And this is just an example of one of the screens we varied in the lab. We did a short-term borrowing exercise. You would borrow to earn money to play an effort task where you would earn income back to try and simulate quick uh, credit decisions with quick return because a lot of this money is being used in microenterprises for fast turnover businesses. So one of the things we did was taking the amount you would have to repay, sorry, I should point to this one, and separating out the principal and the finance. And we found just doing that, we reduced in the lab experiment default rates on the first loan cycles from 29% to 20%. Tiny little programming change. You know, give me two hours of their, their IT people and they could do that. Um, we also found people were having, not viewing terms and conditions even when they had a phone enabling that. So we created kind of an interstitial screen. Originally, it's request a loan. These are the options you can go to the menu. Request a loan, about the loan product, view terms and conditions. Well, this is way more interesting, and this one is also third. So you're not going to be surprised. No one would view this. And so in our experiment, we said, let's not even try and have this compete. Let's have an in-between screen before you get to choosing the loan amount that says, kindly take a minute. So you opt in an active choice. And that increased readership from 9.5% to 23.8%. That's still way too low, if I'm being honest, but getting better. And 7% absolute drop in delinquency rates when we ran the correlations with viewing terms and conditions. Um, all right, so the last one, we're also experimenting with these digital channels create risk, but they also create opportunity. So this is an interactive SMS program we did with Empower, which is a mobile money-based savings and loan product run by Commercial Bank of Africa in Tanzania. And we worked with them and with Busara Center for Behavioral Research, Arifu, which is an interactive SMS provider, and TechnoServe, to leverage this content for programs they were doing with, uh, outreach to farmers in rural Tanzania around Empower. Because these farmers don't, they have significant time and distance barriers to access bank branches. So this product would be perfect for them. You can save and earn interest, and then you can access liquidity. So we developed a bunch of different learning trees. We tested um, eight different behaviorally informed SMS push invites to see which had higher adoption rates. We ended up about 4.8% conversion, uh, which is pretty standard in the field for push SMS invites. But what's inter most interesting to me is the impact on savings. So this is, Blue is I did not access the learning platform. Orange is they did. And this is the savings difference. And it's about 2,000 shillings to the dollar. So you can see huge differences across the whole customer base. And in particular, when we looked at only customers who had done at least one savings transaction, the difference was, was even greater. So this is a huge change in getting farmers to save on this platform just through interactive SMS. Now, this ended up interacting with the loan because the main way you're, you're scored for credit risk in this product is by how much money you have stored in that mobile savings account. 
right? So that's how they'd score you. And the big complaint with these, these nano credit products is, great, you gave me a 50 cent loan. What am I gonna do with that? And we heard that from the farmers in, in the piloting of the SMS messages. But because we got them to save more, you can see across all the different learning contents, we did narrative, fact-based, social norm-based, we tested a bunch of different learning content. They all dominate in terms of amount dispersed and repaid for, the, for the, those who did not access the learning content. So you're saving more, so you're getting more useful liquidity, and you're repaying it at equal or better rates. So that sounds like a better product match to me. Um, so where are we now? So we've been working on this for a few years, and um, we have several toolkits. And we're doing, we're trying to see, you know, in the case of you know higher capacity regulators or lower capacity, how much do they just need the tools? How much do they need this technical assistance to do the research? We're going to be doing a series of trainings um, with policymakers. So get you know three to five people from the market conduct team, um, you know, in Kenya and Tanzania, for example, and do a one week crash course on behaviorally informed policy design and get them to develop a policy project to implement. Um, we're also doing a lot more work on this digital credit and digitization in general, because that's where we need more learning. Because when I think about where is consumer protection going in these markets, that's the next big issue we have to solve. So sorry I ran a little over time, but I think we're I think we're all good. So we are going to shift a bit the topic. Uh, we are going to talk about now about saving lives and um, road safety and why does road safety matters to behavioral insights. So for that, let me just give you a bit of context. Um, what's going on in the in the global um, robots in the global road safety crisis? Uh, we are facing. 1.2 million deaths annually in the world because of car crashes. Uh, those road deaths are the leading cause of death for young people. People between 15 and 24 years old are the ones that are dying the most. Lower and middle income countries bear the largest burden of the global cost with 91% of the fatalities, but only 50% of the vehicles registered in the world. And the world is paying attention. Is, is the world paying attention to this? Yes, it is. It is, not at the pace that we would like to, uh, them, them to, to pay attention, but they are. So UN Decade of Action for Road Safety has been a program that has been launched in 2010 with the intentions to having road fatalities by 2020. This goal has been already reaffirmed under the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals just adopted last September in 2015. Going directly to India, what's going on on the road safety agenda in, in India in terms of data? We know that 11 of all global road traffic fatalities occurred in India. And there, only 3% of all registered vehicles are, are, are part of the, uh, of, of the problem. In the last 10 years, we faced a 53 increase percent in the country um, due to, to, to um, fatalities or fatalities or, or due to car crashes. And th there is a continued motorization, number of vehicles doubled in, last, in less than 10 years. So 400 people are dying per day in the country and um, much more are injured, around one 50, 150,000 people got killed on Indian roads every year. 63% of those fatalities are occurring in national and state highways. And again, 
54 of road deaths are among young people. 54% uh, of road deaths are among young people. So with this data, with this context, would it be possible for India to achieve the ambitious goal of half the deaths, the fatalities, in the next three years in order to achieve the UN goal? Certainly, it's quite difficult. And what we are trying to answer is what is possible for India to achieve, instead of whether they are going to get there in four or five years, what is possible for them to achieve? Well, first of all, let me, let me say that road safety, we are dealing, when we are talking about road safety, we are dealing with a complex disease. It's a disease, but it's a complex one. So one shot vaccine will not take care of the problem, uh, as we see in many other diseases. And we are learning that business as usual, the way that the governments in low and middle income countries are treating the disease, are not going to get us so far. So for instance, focus on small infrastructure changes, mainly black spots, no enforcement on highways, and certainly a lack of coordination among so many agencies that needs to deal with the problem are things that are not getting us anywhere. We need to shift the focus based on evidence and based on best practices that we are seeing in other countries where there has been a lot of successes already in terms of shifting the, uh, the fatalities uh, figures. So by shifting that focus, we mean that, first of all, we have to recognize that we need to deal with a multi-sectorial system. When we are talking about road safety, there is not one only thing or one element by which you concentrate uh, so, so much that then you can have the fatalities drop. It's the opposite. You need to have a several, and not only iteration, but al also several and consistent measures in order for us to drop the fatalities seriously, seriously. So the road safety system, as you can see there, you have a post-crash crash problem or a post-crash things that you need to take care of, the, institu the institution regulations, the infrastructure, the enforcement, civil societies, and vehicles. All of them, they, all of these components has different or specific things that we can do within each. But what we are learning is that there is not enough measures if we don't combine them with a focus on behaviors. How can we change the behaviors that are dealing with each of these elements and components? And here, I'm not talking only about road users, because when you are talking about behaviors in enforcement, you are talking about both road users and the traffic police. And we have to face the fact that in low and middle income countries, the traffic police doesn't have the right behaviors vis-a-vis -vis saving lives or even understanding their roles on saving lives. Let me see. I am losing. Oh, here. Thank you. Um, when we are dealing with the systematic program, we at the World Bank, mainly in the, in the transport GP in which we are working, our work is mainly on infrastructure. Therefore, what we do is we are approaching the infrastructure issues from a very engineering angle. But we are learning that is not enough if you really want to move the needle, it's not enough for us to go and say, let's have safer roads. That's critical, that's crucial, but that's only one part of the equation. The other part is, let's make sure that in those interventions where we are going to have civil works and where, where we are going to see improvements, we really are going to focus on 
the way that the road users are using those um, highways and roads before we start the intervention. So much that we will try to project what it will happen once we finish with the interventions that we are um, being asked by the clients. So focusing on key risky behaviors at the same time that design, at the same time that we are designing the infrastructure that is going to be needed, it's going to be much more intelligent decision. And of course, one thing that is very important is understanding the concept of inclusive infrastructure. So when we are dealing with any request from our clients, we need to start thinking about whether the client is understanding the reality that is facing in the streets. For example, if you are thinking about just um, in, uh, drivers, the way that you are going to design the intervention is pretty different from the one that you are going to use if you are thinking about pedestrians and motorcycles and cyclists. And believe me, this sounds rather obvious, but in, much more, in, in, in many cases, what we are facing is the opposite. The people, the client, uh, the engineers, they don't understand the importance of having an inclusive way of designing the roads so much that they just take out safety measures from the very beginning uh, when, they are, when they are designing. Let me share with you two success stories um, where we have seen a very important changes in the, um, in the figures once we provide or once they provide, this is not the World Bank uh, um, a work, this is in Australia, the state of Victoria, where they have been doing over 30 years, more than 30, 30 years, specific interventions in the infrastructure level. They have concentrated on civil works related to road safety. It's not only about improving the infrastructure, but it's improving the infrastructure from a road safety perspective. But not only that, they, as you can see there, they have added, let me see if this is, sorry, no, no, okay, no. They have, they have added also measures on key risky behaviors. So drinking and driving here, expanding mobile camera programs for, for speed, um, seat belts, bicycle helmets, media campaigns that were completely focused on key risky behaviors. And then by the time that they start, the, 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 the amount of fatalities were 1,100. By the time that we can see, by the time that uh, 30 years have passed, they have been able to drop the amount of fatalities to 300. But this has been because of the safer infrastructure program plus focusing on specific behaviors throughout many years of interventions. Let me go now to the second case. In my hometown, hometown Costa Rica, what we have done is focusing at, again, and the same, uh, uh, um, as, as I was saying in, in Australia, focusing on key risky behaviors. So you can see here that we came from 17 ratio to 15 and then 14 by just changing the safety belt law, the, but by pulling or, or putting in place um, the, the law for safe, uh, safety belt. Here, we have done this, but we didn't manage to keep it. Instead of the Australian example, where you saw that at some point the trend was all the way going in one direction, in our case, there, there has been cycles. So you see this, then again, there was a huge uh, uh, coming, coming up. Then you see again a, um, a down or a drop in the fatalities here, 
mainly because we changed the traffic law. By changing the traffic law and pulling more high or pulling more fines or higher fines, we managed to do again a big drop on fatalities. But what ha had happened is that here, our court of law, our constitutional co court of law, start second guessing the law and start telling uh, or, or, or thinking or rethinking whether those fines were fair or were needed. So much that the people then start rethinking their behavior and even the traffic police start just uh, pushing back or not doing um, the, the, the need in the streets. So again, fatalities went up. Then the, the, the Supreme Court again says, yes, well, uh, the fines are okay. Everything is it's fair and needed. And therefore, you see here, again, a drop of the, uh, of the ratio. What happened after that is that, despite the fact that you can have the best law in writing, if you don't have enforcement, if the police doesn't do their job in the street, and if you have not done this over a long period of time, as you know better than me, then the behavior will not change. The culture, the shift that we need to do in the culture is not going to happen. Now let me go to the state of Uttar Pradesh, where we are now designing a project based on a mix between focusing on behaviors plus infrastructure improvements. In this state, one of the poorest states of, of India, 200 million people, 17,000 people got killed in their streets every year. What we are doing is concentrating in one highway, and in that highway, we are adding enforcement, media campaigns, improving emergency response and, tra and trauma care, and of course, monitoring and evaluating the impact of these measures. When we are saying that we are adding enforcement, it's because the police there in UP, they don't have any dedicated force vis-a-vis -vis road safety. They don't even patrol the highways. So it's a huge change, the one that we are asking from them. And if we manage to make that change, the promise is that we will go to see a big drop. What's new in the project is that we are focusing on behaviors, not only at the road users again, but also at the police and at key agencies. Transportation, as much as finance, as much as infrastructure um, uh, policy makers, they need to act together under one body to make sure that they will go uh, for the right policy changes and the right um, drop in fatalities. There is also a significant resource allocation for intensive media campaigns, but we are learning that you cannot do this without focus. We need to understand first which are the vulnerable users that are being dying or killed in that particular road, and then use the media campaign completely focused to these, uh, to, to, to these uh, users. And most definitely, we are now working with Gini team to make out of this a scientific approach. If we can learn how to make this from a much more structured way, we then will become or will come with a model that we can replicate in other places in the country. Just let me finish by showing with you what is the challenge that we are talking about. Just in pictures. This is a picture that I took myself in Varanasi. This is a reality in India, and this is the reality that we need to face. Without understanding this reality, we will not be able to 
support the client as much. And finally, this picture is just showing that sometimes for um, road users, although they follow the law, they follow the rule of law, they don't follow it because they believe on it so much that they don't care whether their loved ones are being protected or not. They are just using the helmet because the law says it's compulsory for the driver. But they are not understanding even why is it that the helmet is needed. So there is a lot of room to improve from the behavior side. And we are learning three things to conclude as much as we are going forward. One thing is the balance between persuasion and enforcement. In road safety, you must keep that balance in mind. You cannot go only for persuasion, not only for enforcement. If you really want to change behaviors, once you have these two hands, you must do so for a long period of time. If you do that for not enough amount of time, you will see that the moment that you st stop any campaign or stop any enforcement, the, the, the behavior will go back to square one most of the cases, and therefore you are going to lose all the work that you have done or have introduced already. And um, the last thing is that it's very, very important to understand that one intervention will not help you as much. So despite the fact that it's very expensive, we need to learn how to make a, a, a group of interventions in the much more efficient way. Because as complex as, it, as, the, as the problem it is, we cannot tackle all the elements of the problem at the same time. So which are the right set of interventions that are going to lead us to, uh, to, to, the, to the successes that we need to start having to save lives, not only in India, but in the world? Thank you. The idea is that uh, we will ask first a few questions that we had prepared, and then we want to open it up for your questions. So we have about another 20 to 25 minutes, so that should be good enough, like if we ask for about 10 minutes or so, and then, okay. Yep. So we have a, until a quarter to. Uh, yeah, let me start. I'll, I'll address this to to Rafe, but obviously interested in hearing what the others think as well, I'll try to make it broader across the topics. But uh, when dealing with partners, in particular in your case, consumer protection units, I'm curious in terms of applying behavioral insights, whether you can spin that as a positive thing, it's something sort of new and exciting for them, it's something they see others doing and they want to keep up with the Joneses, or whether it's something negative because it's untested or they're risk averse and it's new and different from what others are doing or whether it's neutral and they don't really care whether you call it behavioral insights or something else they just want something that works so maybe i'll go with option c i think the key because in the markets i'm working with behavioral insights is relatively unknown in those units um a lot of times the people in the consumer protection units maybe they came from banking supervision or from legal or a lot of times from legal, so they have sort of a different perspective. I think more than anything, it's, it's making it personal. That's the, that's the best selling point we have with all this, is this is about human behavior, and the people we're trying to influence are humans. So, it's, so in the case of Mexico, I'll give Mexico and Ghana as good examples. Um, in Mexico, it started by just um, you know, breaking the rule of research and having a higher up person at Conducef sit in on these focus groups that they had asked us to conduct and hearing from consumers and seeing consumers totally misuse and ignore the mandatory disclosure formats 
and so, yeah, now they're very interested in behavior. And so it can be something as simple as, as that. Um, or in, in, in Ghana, I think it was, it was a bit more of a, a long process, but the other, the other key, I think, is, is getting the timing right in terms of the being opportunistic. Um, because when we do research just for the, for the sake of getting them exposed to behavioral research, it's less effective than in Ghana, they decided we are writing a credit disclosure directive and we are writing a recourse and complaints handling directive. And so you said, well, if you use these methods, they asked us to help draft the, the directives. And they said, if you use these methods, it'll be more effective. So I think those are the two sort of lever points that I find are the most effective, rather than trying to get them up front to understand behavioral concepts, because I think it's, it's very new in the financial consumer protection space. So let me just add one question to that. I yeah, don't need a mic because I have this one. Um, so how does it even happen that they approach you? Like, do they know that you do this kind of work? Do they already have a sense of what behavioral science is? Or do you also do some other work? Like, like why are they even coming to you in the first place? Mainly, my boss is really charming. Oh. She is, <laughs> Kate McKee, she is sort of just amazing in the room. And so I think you have to, yeah, when you're, when you're you know, trying to engage people on something that's new and kind of abstracted, mm -hmm. you have to be going to where they go. So the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, mm -hmm. you know, they convene, so this is the network of financial sector regulators in emerging markets, and they have 120, something like that, members. So, for example, they have a consumer protection working group. In March, at their last convening, we invited those who wanted to come a day early and did a one-day workshop on behavioral design for consumer protection policy. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to meet them there. Um, in the policy world, you have, to, you have to have a lot of touch points. You have to come once, come twice, come again, and you have to physically give the report, don't send an attachment by email, um, things like that. So you really, you know, there's a whole lot of lead in, and if I can just editorialize, one of the challenges I've had working with more academic researchers is not being interested in that part of it. So like I said, I'm a bureaucrat, not an academic. I want to see good policies that protect consumers, and the, the sort of things that the researchers have developed make that more effective, but I think I would like to see more interest in the sort of the how the sausage is made part because you can't have that in policy change. Um, you can't have the research to, alone. You have to be invested in that. Mm -hmm. any, any thoughts from either of you on? It's a great idea. In India, I think the basic problem for road safety has a lot to do with behavior. Behavior of the drivers, 77% of the accidents mortality data which Carla showed you are because of driver error. It is concentrated among the younger people with pedestrians, with two wheelers, and uh, each of them can be linked back to this uh, very slack traffic laws, laws which do not have sufficient power. For example, the, the penalty for a wrong parking in India is less than two dollars. It's cheaper for me to park wrongly and go away rather than pay the penalty. The penalty for a hit and run is virtually negligible. I mean, you know, I cannot, it's very difficult to prosecute a person under hit and run. Whether it is culpable homicide or whether, what kind of offense it is very difficult to do. So one thing that we are trying to do is to improve the law, is to, is to make it stricter and harder. Then we get into the question of enforcement. So now if I very, have a very stiff fine for traffic jumping a red light, there's a question of affecting the behavior of the enforcement official. The question of bribes and other things like that. Um, what do we do? How do we? I've been listening to this deliberation with great interest. There is a lot of scope. I mean, in the sense, we need to affect the driver's behavior. All the most accidents take place due to commercial vehicles. I mean, trucks. We have had some studies which show that these people have very low self-esteem. They work under very trying circumstances. They they have they often lack proper training. So we need to first reach out to them probably, you know, because they are causing large proportion of the accidents. What do, we, uh, what do we do to pedestrians? How do we handle their behavior? How do we handle the behavior of the, you know, let's say the younger persons? 
there are some thoughts that you know instead of prosecuting a young person and putting him or her in jail, the option of community service, which is often used in your country and other places, could be expo uh, explored. And if there is a person who's a juvenile with repeat offenses, maybe we could delay the holding on of a driving license eligibility from 18 years to 21 years. Um, maybe when, the, again, there is a, in Delhi recently, there was a spate of juvenile ac uh, accidents caused by juvenile drivers who took out the dad's cars and killed a lot of people. Maybe we have to have some idea of presumed some kind of complicity of the guardian or the parent in case such an accident takes place. I'm sorry I'm focusing overly maybe on law and enforcement, but I'm a career civil servant too, and so I'm only trained in this. <laughs> and, but uh, we would be more than happy to listen to any other kind of insights of how to change behavior across the board, across the board, law enforcement, the persons concerned, the traffic enforcement group, the people who do the training, and things like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, on that, uh, so on that note, so I do think it is very important to have the basic infrastructure and the laws, first of all, in place and, and, and the enforcement. So um, it, it was very fascinating to see how complex the issue is, like when we just talk about the road safety. So if we just zoom in, for example, on the behavior of the new highway police that, that you would like to build. Or if we just zoom in first on just that new highway police that you want to build up, I mean, there are so many interesting behavioral questions to ask. Like, um, is there anything, for example, in the recruitment process of, the, of that new highway police that you want to change in comparison to the regular recruitment? Because is there maybe a way to find certain people who are um, much more uh, motivated by trying to save uh, lives and improving the community? That's one thing. Then you can think about, okay, well, what are maybe interventions to, to change just um, the atmosphere and, and the reputation of the police outside as well as inside. Like, what do we believe as police people about ourselves? How do we view ourselves? Can we affect that through the way how the uniform maybe even looks like? I mean, there are just so many interventions in that sphere. And then there, there is a behavior of the consumers, so the drivers and the pedestrians. So that is very complex, but at the same time also very interesting because I do think that there are very, that there are many angles um, that one can um, look at. What I find, however, challenging, so from a World Bank perspective, how do you even start? Uh, like, like, how do you know with which ministries you now have to engage with? And, and, and how do you even get to the stage of saying, okay, you know what, now we have the basic infrastructure in place. We would like to think about using some behavioral insights. We would like to think about maybe even running some experiments. Like who are the people that you as, as a World Bank person have to talk to in the government? And, and, and for you, from a government perspective, where do you see um, the dangers, the risks, um, of, of using behavioral insights because it is such a non-traditional approach or a non-traditional way of thinking for you? So the what, thank you. Uh, so the what is not so difficult. We have seen that in other countries. And I myself have done it in my, in my country. So we do know which are the ministers, the right uh, ministries that needs to come to, to, to the board of a road safety uh, authority. We don't know what works and what doesn't. But the how is where really we see the biggest challenge. How to make sure that we are going to bring that traffic police change that you were referring to. So for instance, nowadays, if you go to any of these low and middle income countries, you will see that the traffic police they feel like uh, they are spectators of what's going on in the streets. And they come like a judge and say, you did fine, or you need a fine, or you are, uh, are, you are going to go to, uh, to jail sometimes, depending on the law. But what we are trying to do 
is to make sure that they understand that they are contributors to what's going on and that they have a very important role on saving the life of people. So becoming heroes, not, not so much policemen. And, and that is very, very important. That shift, we have done it in my country, but it was not sustained. So the, the problem is that it requires a lot of leadership and personal skills from the people that is in charge. And therefore, once, if you don't have the right training, if you don't have the, the amount of resources, then, then you might not have that in a, in a sustained way. Having said that, we have seen that in countries where you have a traffic police that is mainly for, uh, or a police that is mainly for traffic, that is separate from the general police, you have much more opportunities to succeed than the countries that have to just use the resources for everything, safety and security at the same time, then the safety side, the safety angle got uh, neglected. So that's also another way of, of, of seeing the, the need for, for change in the behavior, in the approach. And then um, you, were, you were saying uh, uh, traffic police and then which was the other question? Oh, in, in general, again, going to the how, what we are learning in the bank is that we need to have behavioral um, insights at the core, at the center of the design when we are dealing with road safety designs. So it's not, again, it's not enough about engineering measures. We need to bring, and we need to spend time, our, te our teams need to start spending time understanding what is it the, the norm in those roads before you go and start the interventions. So it is a big challenge. It poses a big uh, um, a challenge in front of us. And it's, of course, asking us for a shift, not only, again, in the way that we are uh, perceiving or the, or the way that we are facing um, the designs, but also in the way that we are bringing together the right teams to think about these things. Um, let me respond to the first, second question first, that you said that behavioral insights is non-traditional way of looking at things. Actually, Indian government and the state governments are quite familiar with behavioral insights. I think the earliest one was through the AIDS control program, where we had a very big intervention based on behavior change of truck drivers who were the high-risk group identified and their condom use. It's been outstandingly successful in India, and the prevalence rates and the transmission rates have fallen dramatically. So we have been engaged on this, this issue. The, of the latest was a very interesting thing. The Prime Minister made an appeal for people, well-heeled people, to relinquish their LPG subsidy, their you know, cooking gas subsidy. Mm -hmm. And I think, I uh, don't have the numbers, I mean, at least upwards of 10 million people, or maybe 6 million, 60 million people, sorry, quit. They voluntarily relinquished their LPG subsidy. So it was, I think, a behavioral uh, you know, impact of a behavioral change of a very substantial dimension. We don't need really to recruit special personnel for highway police. We just need to train them properly. Mm -hmm. uh, they will be the same kind of person that was recruited for ordinary crime work or ordinary investigation work. But this person will have to be trained properly, you know, how to respond to the first responder. And if at all he or she responds to saving lives, then there has to be special quality of training. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can address this thing. It's not a very difficult thing to do. But what I am looking for uh, is that Law and environment and enforcement is our job. Probably we'll do it. How do we complement it with other, you know, maybe softer interventions, which can give positive results all around? You know, how do I? The lorry drivers are they suffer from self-esteem, poor self-esteem. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, we talked about 500 or 600. They don't get married. They don't get, you know, their people are unwilling to give their daughters to them and you know get them married. And so in India, we still have this arranged marriage system, right? So, because it's seen as an unsafe and a dirty job. Mm -hmm. So there is a road rage element built into his entire mentality. So maybe we can reach out to them. Maybe we can reach out to the younger drivers. Maybe we can reach out to the courts. So there's a lot of scope of doing this, you know, so. So I'll probably open it up since we're running, not late, but it's, minutes. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we have about 10 minutes. 
So when we have questions, I guess we do have to repeat them like yesterday in the session. No, we don't? OK, good. Yes, please. My question is for Rafe, yeah. and this is a tactical how the sausage is made question. <laughs> um, going back to one of your slides, can you tell us a little bit about the treatments, specifically the one about um, the Arif Arifu as trainer treatment? That yeah. one significantly outperformed the others. Yeah. So I'm really curious what it was. So that was, um, we, we played around with branding because this was an independent um, short code. So it's, it's a separate menu from the savings met product that exists on the mobile phone that Vodacom offers in Tanzania. And we wanted to see what is the most effective way in which to present this learning platform. It's totally out of the blue. So we tested, you know, kind of neutral reference, not saying that Arifu, which is this startup that does interactive learning content, was a provider. Then we had um, one that was um, sort of saying, you know, this is brought to you by Arifu. And then we had one that just said, hi, I'm Arifu. You know, I'm here to help you learn more about Empower. And that was by far the most powerful. So we think the, the conversational hook and the sort of personalization um, because Arifu is a, is a Swahili word. Um, I think it basically means sort of like, like show me or educate me. Um, we think that worked better. So that had the quality of an online chat. I mean, just like so many companies have nowadays where it comes up, hi, I'm Anya from Ikea. I'll exactly. Like, okay. Yeah, and it was based on like one of the anecdotal things that sort of inspired that, um, besides just wanting to, to measure that effect, was one of the older farmers that I was, we did, we tested a kind of very basic interactive SMS um, with farmers, you know, before we developed the, the program, obviously. And this one farmer, he got in about one or two slides in and he goes, I don't know. He goes, this, uh, this Arifu person who I'm talking to, he goes, I just don't know what his intentions are. <laughs> and so, so he had, like, he was certain it was a, another human, but he's like, What's this guy up to, you know? And so then we thought, okay, let's try and test a kind of conversational personalization up front. You know, I'm your, your guide. Thank you. Yes, please. So um, still to you, I noticed that your, in your um, work with government officials, you spend a lot of time doing pilots and focus group discussions, right? So a government official comes and says, we want you to do something for us. And usually they come in with assumptions about what is happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. But they still let you invest their money in piloting, in doing focus group discussions, which means they believe in this process uh, that the assumptions we're making might not be correct. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the biggest obstacles in trying to incorporate behavioral insights into policy. Mm -hmm. How do we, when we sit down with this person who really cares about the problem, who's worked in it for 50 years, and want you to help, how do we convince him that maybe, maybe we're wrong and we need to spend some time before we launch this uh, thing, sort of designing and understanding based on, based on you know, what these people are doing, what the problem is. Yeah, yeah. that's an excellent point. So on, one quick thing on the funding, it's, it's CGAP money. Um, because we can't, I mean, so some, well, actually some do self-fund. We're doing a project um, with a, a central European government that's going to self-fund. There's another one in Asia. But, like Bank of Ghana, the budget is so scarce for this new consumer protection team, there's no way they could fund it. And that's where a public resource. Um, but what you said is really important because I think it's, it's not about convincing them, it's about showing them and having them convince themselves. And one of, the, one of my pet peeves is I'm a huge traditional financial education skeptic. Well, not. Skeptic would mean I, I think they might be right. I don't think they're right. It doesn't work. Um, the, and one of the most common things you hear when we do initial problem definition exercises with, with regulars is, you know, consumers, they, they just need to be un informed. They just need to become less ignorant. And then that leads to these super expensive programs where you're trying to make them accountants. It doesn't work. Whereas this heuristics-based financial capability pilots, we're seeing those are working because they're applied to their life. But that's a really hard thing to rewrite in an argument over a table. So you have to, in that case, say, well, hey, let's test this other approach. And then let's see, see the outcome. So you ha like you said, it's, you got to be delicate and you got to let people convince themselves. And that's where the upfront happens. You can't just go in and 
and get allowed to do the research and then publish your your paper. You gotta you gotta want to change the 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 perspective of your client if you want this to actually lead to policy change. I would love to hear the secretary if you have any yeah. on the idea of pilot testing within governments and trying things out. Is that something that that are open to? Is there a way to frame that to make it more palatable? I have very mixed views on pilots. India is littered with, you know, the skeletons of dead pilots all over the place, and so it's it's not a. Uh, but having said that, there is uh, merit in doing a pilot in case the program is complex or you're trying to address a major issue. But um, I have kind of mixed feelings of that. It works sometimes. It sometimes doesn't work. But I think in a case like uh, RAFES, where you are looking at financial literacy, a pilot is useful. In our case, road safety, there's no pilot. You are just go in straight away. Yes, please. Yeah, it was interesting. I've been working in East Africa recently, and um, I came from a background of tax and behavioral insights. So I've been trying to change the way I am as a consultant in those countries. And um, it's interesting around pilots. You had to find the hook. If you do a pilot, but you do it at a large taxpayer end, it's a smaller number, we can test it. You're going to get dollars out of it. So it's like one of the motivators that then you get a bit of a win-win, and then they go, oh, that worked. And so, but it was around follow-up, I would say to you, because you first have the conversation and everyone's nodding, agreeing, and then you go, they have no idea what I actually am saying. So it is a sustainable program, and if you don't do that follow-up, it doesn't work. But um, in relation... Uh, to you know, the starting question, I think, is it around also around convincing donors that this more sustainable, progressive process, rather than just here's one paper and then we leave? Are you, how are you finding that in the bank as opposed to the people I work with? Well, I think the the World Bank is the best ally we have um, because there's a whole nother besides Jeannie. There's this. Um, financial consumer protection team at the World Bank, who all they do is work on two to three year projects to implement consumer protection policy. And they have taken our tools and have run with them. And so they can integrate this in, because they can get the meeting with the, uh, with the, the director general of the central bank. And they can integrate this into a multi-phase diagnostic. So there'll be these testing, approaches. There'll be the mystery shopping. There'll be the lab testing. There'll be other things. And I, so I think there's, there's not enough donors. If we're looking in the financial inclusion space, I think a lot of donors don't fund consumer protection, and it really concerns me. World Bank, GIZ do excellent work on that. I think we've spent way too much money on industry association-led certification programs in financial consumer protection. They don't work because you have a problem of the commons where the one guy who complies with ethical disclosure of credit products is now at a disadvantage with other guys who didn't sign on to the voluntary association. And so then a few months later, he's like, I'm not going to be the sucker. So he, you know, he opts out and it falls apart. So, but yeah, sorry, that was maybe not what you were asking. No, no, no. But, uh, but it's interesting when you were talking about behavioural insights and when you actually say, I'm actually helping you with behavioural insights, I find it's more around I'm actually helping you understand how do you make it easier for the consumer, how yeah. do you um, are able to change people's behaviour in an easier way. You might mention in the second or third meeting you're actually using behavioural sciences or things that I found up front. It's a, it's an, a different term in East Africa or... Yeah, yeah, it's not going to resonate as no. much. Yeah, I mean, some of what we do is just consumer research, yeah. you know. I mean, I'm fine with that being the starting point. Some consumer research is better than nothing, you know, especially when we're just starting out. We do one more question. Right. So um, you all work across lots of different cultures, contexts, um, and but kind of in a, in a very specific realm or domain, right? So I guess um, what is it every time you work with a new partner in a new country that you're having to start all over, even if it's an enthusiastic partner that has saying we're addressing the same challenge that you know that you addressed in in Mexico. Um, how confident are you in saying in saying okay, let's just take what we learned there and start with that as our control. 
um, versus saying like, well, we ran this, it worked, let's just run it again as a test. So I'm kind of wondering about sort of the scalability across countries and contexts within the same sort of research question. So um, we don't start all over again. We, we carry on the best practices and the successful stories, of course, and the knowledge sharing, the way that our teams start sharing knowledge. But certainly, or, or most definitely, we need to be very conscious about what the client needs. And, and this, is, this is sometimes uh, something uh, that we overlooked and we need to learn better how to make sure that we go for the right assessment of the situation and in the road safety agenda, sometimes we need even to push back a bit because there are some clients that are asking things that has, doesn't make any sense. If they just say, we have X amount of money, therefore you just take out all the elements that are accessory, and all these accessories happens to be the ones that will save lives, then we have to say, sorry, we cannot do as much. So we will not do as much as you, as, as you would like to. In that sense, we are advisors. But at the end of the day, the client, um, it's, it's, it's the one that makes the decision, of course. Having said that, um, the tailor-made approaches are very important when you're trying to change behaviors. Otherwise, you are not going to get afar. If you just neglect what is it that the data is showing, why is it that the people are doing X or Y in a specific countries or even in a specific cities, then you are not going to go for the right measures um, uh, uh, and to implement the right measures. I agree with you. We, uh, we tend to pick up um, you know, as a, as a government, we pick up experiences from maybe seminars like this or from other interactions from the World Bank, from other donors, or even from the successful experiment that had been done in our country earlier. I mean, we have this hugely successful experiment on AIDS control, and where we went out, reached out to the truck drivers, and changed their behavior. It was done very well. It was done over a long period of time. It has been successful. So if you could do that on a very personal issue, I think we, as we have reason to hope that, you know, on uh, a thing like, you know, better behavior on the roads and less aggression, maybe we can, we can make something. We never really thought on this angle before, before we started handling road safety as a public health issue. So that's the thing that we've learned. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for attending our panel. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have some more questions to the speakers, they will be here throughout the day. And I guess we are all ready for lunch then. Thank you very much. Thank you.